Good evening and welcome. Uh, my name is Dr. Kevin Jones. I am the, the research director at the City Region Study Centre, part of the University of Alberta's uh, faculty of extension. Uh, once again, uh, it's my enormous uh, pleasure to hope this, host this evening's uh, lecture and panel discussion on the subject of urban ecologies uh, and green space planning. And I'm sure you visited the table and the posters over there to coincide with the city's very proud launch of their uh, integrated green network strategy, Breathe. Um, tonight's discussion uh, is the outcome of a partnership between the City Region Study Centre's Regional Planning Speakers Series and the City's uh, Great Cities, Great Talk series. Um, echoing some of the conversations and comments that were made at an earlier lecture today, uh, planning and, and good city building need to be transformative. They need to create a positive future for us and, and uh, getting together, collaborating, um, sharing our expertise, our leadership, and our tools is really important for that. So thanks very much to the City of Edmonton to, to give us the opportunity um, to partner with you. And thank you to our sponsors at Municipal Affairs and Brown LLP for also sharing um, not only their financial support, but their expertise in, in, in guiding the Regional Planning Speaker Series. I'm sure I've said it before up there, and if you've been to our events, this may sound like repetition, but one of the great pleasures uh, of my job is that I get to meet um, tremendous thinkers and speakers that are leading our communities in, in new directions locally and, and across our country. Sometimes it's over a cup of coffee. Um, I get to chat with our speakers through walks through our streets, over the telephone, um, in the buildup, and I always learn um, uh, a tremendous amount. Um, in working with our guest for this evening, I was struck um, by the value she places on green spaces and urban ecologies as part of the fabric, or I think as you described it earlier, as part of the landscape of our cities. Not a natural break or a respite within a, an otherwise artificial world, but something inextricable um, from the health and prosperity of our communities today and the infrastructure which can support resilient urban lives into the future. Um, Professor Nina Marie Lister is a respected planning practitioner, academic, writer, and communicator. And I, I just want to say those are not easy things to combine. Um, she's from Ryerson University. Her work explores the relationship between landscape and ecology and urbanism. She's asked me not to read the whole spiel um, and simply to look her up on the web to find out more information about her. Um, tonight, we're also going to be joined by a panel um, of Peter Ohm, our chief planner for the city of Edmonton, uh, Candace Nikiforic, who's a professor in public health at the University of Alberta, uh, and Professor Christoph Van Asch, who's a colleague of mine at the Faculty of Extension uh, and who works within the, the planning program as well. But before welcoming the panel to the stage, it's my great pleasure uh, to once again welcome Nina Marie Lister to the stage uh, for tonight's keynote presentation. Welcome. Well, thank you very much for having me here and uh, for giving up a beautiful, sunny, early summer evening to sit indoors in this lovely space. I appreciate your energy and your interest. That is a theme I've come to realize perhaps is characteristic of Edmontonians. Am I allowed to say Edmontonians? Um, I have, must say to you that I have not received such a warm and gracious welcome in a very long time. Uh, by a very high level and engaged group of people. And I don't know if that means I'm visiting the wrong places or I just haven't been to the right one until now. Uh, so I thank you for that. It has truly been a delight. And for me, with a high degree of reciprocal learning. Um, and that's important. It's a value I think that um, we want to place on intellectual learning and social learning, exchange of ideas, um, which I hope is why I'm here tonight and why you're here as well. I want to congratulate you as well. Uh, you have a, a city here that demonstrates to me, at least to my eyes, as a Torontonian by birth and by um, employment at the moment and life, um, you have a city that represents some, for my terminology, kind of old Canadian values, a belief in the public sector, a belief in, to a large extent, the, some collaboration around good ideas. The level of intellectual exchange here on this topic has been very high across and consistent uh, across the agencies with whom I've been in communication. 
And I would also say the chance to speak to a, a group of people from um, publics broadly defined, but that's being convened by your mayor, your chief planner, your university, and one of the deans in the faculty of the university is a rare treat. And so just in case you're not aware of it or you've forgotten it, that's pretty special. It, that kind of alignment of star thinking and elevation of the ideas sets the bar for, the, for public expectations as well. And I expect that most of you have those expectations. That's why you're here and your interest and your engagement um, are palpable. Um, and that's pretty important, particularly as you grow. And we all in Canadian cities right now are facing that. Those challenges to some extent are shared. So my aim here tonight is, yes, to congratulate you on amazing work that you're doing on the subject we're going to be talking about, both in my conversation with the panelists and with you, but also in the achievements of releasing the strategy, the Breathe uh, Green Network strategy, which is remarkable for a number of reasons. It's also a very special moment for me because uh, today, Toronto at noon uh, released its draft of something very similar. It's not called a Green Network Strategy. It's called the Toronto Ravine Strategy, but it was presented to council and to the public today. And it's quite remarkable in how similar and resonant both its attributes and its challenges are with you here in Edmonton. So I'm not here to tell you um, what to do. I'm not here to celebrate what my city is doing. I'm here to uh, invigorate, I hope, inspire a conversation, provoke some problem solving. And also, in addition to congratulating you, I'm here to push you a little bit. My job, I think, is to encourage you to go farther to aim higher and to think beyond the strategies that you already have to how you might ignite those forward. As your city grows, you're a youthful and youth demographic. You also have a high degree of respect for elder learning from what I can tell, both in your heritage, in indigenous knowledge and the diversity of your communities. And you're also growing fast. But you have another thing that we don't have. You have a lot of space. At least that's the perception. And I think you want to use it wisely. You want to invest in it responsibly. And you want to plan it with care, compassion, and attention. And so I think that it is not enough to have a strategy, a strategic plan, an official plan, a natural areas plan. It's much more important that you have a vision for how that will be ignited and animated and how it will capture the public imagination. It's not enough to have those old Canadian values of too much humility, or as my colleague <clears throat> in the community world, Andy Chisholm, often says, satisfactory underperformance, right? That's not a goal for us. It's not good enough for Edmonton. It's got to be good enough for your children, better than what you have right now. And so as I go through my lecture slides and some of the comments I want to make, I hope you keep in mind that the, the point here is to say, you're doing something really amazing, but don't forget it, and it could be even better. So let's talk about what that looks like. Let's talk about ecological urbanism and what that might mean in the context of your green structure planning and in the context of parks. So I'd like to say, begin by saying that ecological urbanism, this is urbanism that's being modified by the word ecological, means alive. It means a landscape in a city that is alive, that is recognizing what sustains it, the physical, the, the life forces that sustain it. And we might recapture those by thinking about green and blue infrastructure. And those are two kind of key concepts that underlie in ecological urbanism. They are just like the roads, bridges, sewers, and pipelines of our engineering or gray infrastructure. They are the infrastructures of land and water. They are what sustains us. And so thinking about the ecology around us, not just as birds, bees, butterflies, and other species, but as that which sustains us emotionally, intellectually, economically, socially, spiritually, and so on. In terms of our overall health and well-being as humans and as a community, that's where we start the conversation. And that's high-level thinking. It's also shifting the conversation a little bit. Why are we doing this? Why does ecological urbanism matter? Well, it matters because we are living in an unprecedented era of urbanization. You all know this, but it's something in a small city that is now big. Is that what way I'm supposed to say it? A, 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 at the small end of the big cities? Um, in the Mid-Canada Corridor, you're growing very quickly, and so you too are facing 
the image, the looming image of an urban landscape that is very different than the one you have now. At the start of the 20th century, only about 10% of the world's population lived in cities, and by 2000, that number was 50%. So here we are in 2016, and for the first time in history, more than half of the world's 7.4 billion human beings live in cities. By 2025, there'll be 5 billion urban dwellers, with two-thirds of them, ladies and gentlemen, in the poorest countries in the world. So we're doing very well. We live in the lap of luxury by comparison. You know, when you think about it, only New York and London, I think, had over 8 million residents uh, in the year 1950. Some of you were alive then. That's not that long ago, really, when you think of the pace of growth. Today, there are 22 megalopoli cities with more than tens of millions of people. And to every single one of them except two are in Asia. So here we are talking about a doubling of your population, which seems to pale by comparison. But doubling your population on the land base you're looking at is significant. And I think that's why we're having this conversation and others. We want to understand that this landscape of connection, this tangled web of roads, rails, bridges, and pipelines, and suburban corridors must not be the only kind of connections we have in the urban landscape. But yet, as we watch our children grow and your grandchildren grow, our cities are now the only landscapes that many children will ever know. So it's time to rethink the urban landscape. It's time to recognize that parks, green spaces, the crowns, the jewels in the crown, as it were, are vital. They're vital to our very survival and to our well-being in the urban condition. This, of course, is Central Park. Everyone understands the value of Central Park in a city, a very dense city of 14 million people but notice that it's not connected to anything. It's connected to the community, but the green part is not connected to other green parts. It's loved to death, just like Toronto's parks are today. We're loving them to death because there are not enough of them, and there are too many of us all wanting different things from the park at the same time. So let's think about getting outside the park and into the urban landscape in a way that redefines it as a vital set of connected tissue, connected fabric that sustains us. In Canada, we talk a lot about getting up close to nature. It's often on our doorsteps. It's not just as this poster for a suburban development in Toronto that is a little bit old now, but it's not just nature and architecture in perfect harmony, as the poster would, would seem to indicate. But rather, it's about recognizing there are real tensions, contradictions, and pressures facing the rest of the ecological beings around us. Uh, as we come closer and closer and encroaching on other species' habitats, we can expect them to be on our doorstep. So the idea of the park means we have to get out of the, the single square box and into a landscape that gives everyone the freedom to roam, the opportunity to move. And how that might be resolved is in the hands of good planning and smart design. It's also a way for us to contend with changing ideas about nature, changing attitudes to what the natural world is and how the landscapes work for us and with us. Whether you're a suburban koi wolf in southern Ontario or an elk roaming through the streets of Canmore, these are creatures that need space to roam, some of which are becoming more familiar with us, maybe more than we would like. So there are very real ideas about the, the urban landscape that we want to remind ourselves have to do with connection and with giving space in, an, in the capacity of an investment. We don't want to see our landscapes severed or fragmented, as this image suggests. This is a Southern Ontario image, which I'm sure is not so different from some of yours. These ideas, though, have gained some traction in the academic world as well as design and planning practice. We are now beginning to think of our urban areas, our cities, not as agglomerations of, agri uh, of architecture, but as landscapes. The urban area is itself a kind of a landscape. And so let's not just redefine the word landscape to mean bricks and mortar and roads and sewers and bridges and pipelines, but let's redefine it to be ecological, understanding that it has performance value. If we invest in it, it gives back to us many fold over the long term, particularly as we grow. We don't want to love our parks to death. We want to invest in the ecological performance, the life-saving, life-sustaining uh, possibilities of those spaces, particularly when they're connected. For our health and wellness, 
for our recreation capacity, and of course, to ameliorate the effects of storm events and other indicators of climate change being upon us. So we think about now our landscape itself as a kind of an infrastructure. Just as we invest in crumbling bridges and expressways, so too must we invest in a living landscape because it has value. It has performance value, it provides services, and it sustains us. So that's the way in which we think about ecological urbanism writ large. But we also can turn our attention to the ideas that the landscape offers potential for remediation, for healing, for fixing past ills, if you like, or for rest restoring values that have become lost, whether it's cleaner water, tree canopy, shade, cooling, flood amelioration, movement of other species, and so on. And we've found various creative ways over the years to communicate these ideas, whether it's through the graphics of a fish um, in the Charles River in Boston, brass fish on the Toronto waterfront, or even the old Dutch markers that say flood to let you know that water is here. So this kind of legibility becomes important in recognizing the value and communicating that value of landscape. To use a Toronto example about what these infrastructures look like. This is the Don River. It's in the heart of the largest city in the country, and it's also the largest urbanized watershed, meaning that it has been channelized, straightened, used for public transportation, used as a dumping ground. And here, and it's really not in its glory anymore, it's flowing south to Lake Ontario, and you can see that it takes a back seat to other kinds of infrastructure. It has hard concrete walls, and it's underneath an expressway. Not a very glamorous place, for a large urban river, rivers that don't typically run straight like this one. And of course, at its outflow to the lake, it doesn't flow majestically in a broad delta into the lake to create a public gathering space. It's a dumping ground. It's choked with very little velocity and not much life. And we know we can change this. We know that this image shows the primacy of the car rather than the value of the river basin. And so this image is a very common one across not only North America, but the world. And it was brought to the forefront of our consciousness in the city of Toronto now 11 years ago. At this particular moment, we happen to be either, depending on your perspective, either in the right place at the wrong time or the wrong place at the right time if you're a photographer. This was in August of 20, 2005, August 15th to be exact. And this is a north arm of the Humber, or the Humber River, which flows into the Don River. And Hurricane Katrina had moved its way north to become a tropical storm. And in 90 seconds, this happened. And so what we're reminded of in this image, that the viaduct that passes over the river, we think of as a superior infrastructure. That's our investment in the city. That's our bridge. That's how we get from point A to point B. But it rests on the river. And even though we can't see the river and it's buried, it's still there. And in a storm event, the river rises again to remind us just who's in charge. That's one way to look at it. The other way to look at it is this is the blue infrastructure that's really got a, a lot of power. And unless we invest in it and recognize the value of that, um, we, we run the risk of more of these kinds of catastrophic incidents happening, particularly when we're not investing in the rebuilding of our physical infrastructure of our, our civil engineering infrastructure. You couple that with downstream flooding as we pave more and more of our urban areas. We don't pay attention to surface treatment. We assume that the water will drain away. It drains to elsewhere. I don't know if you know where that is. Elsewhere, it's somewhere out there. But elsewhere in Toronto is right there at rush hour. It's inconvenient to say the least, but when you have to be airlifted from your car and from the regional GO train, it's more than just a pain. Um, you certainly have seen your fair share of this in Alberta with the Bow River flood. So I don't need to tell you that urban flooding at a time when we're seeing an increase in the magnitude and the frequency of storm events is a real problem. It's a very costly problem. So we can also think of a landscape infrastructure, an ecological approach to infrastructure as a smart investment for adaptation and ultimately resilience to these kinds of events not paving the area, reducing the amount of water that enters that system by catching and using rain where it falls is a useful idea. If we follow how 
urban flow patterns work using these diagrams, you can see that they, water tends to flow along our human-made infrastructure. So can we realign our infrastructure with a natural pattern for water to improve drainage in a more healthy and useful way for long-term investment? That's one question we can ask. When we think about what blue and green infrastructure means, uh, tangibly, what it looks like, here are some treatment ideas. We're talking not about specific spaces in the landscape for one kind of a park versus another, but a connected network of everything from downtown manicured parks in which we have picnics and gathering celebrations right through to the wilder places, and Edmonton has lots of these. Your ravine system along the North Saskatchewan River is nothing short of magnificent. And unlike Toronto's ravine, it's not actually hidden in plain sight. It's everywhere around you. Um, ours have been subsumed by super tall buildings and by subway stations and by a burgeoning population that can't even find the entrance to the ravines. Yours are magical secret places that are on the doorstep of virtually all of your outlying suburban areas, from my point of view. So that's something to think about. You already have this space for investment, where water and land and vegetation cover come together to provide this living landscape infrastructure. It's also scalable. It can move from the, the little tiny projects by one community in a, at, a, at a site level right up to the whole precinct of, for example, I think I'm supposed to say ICE district. I'm not supposed to say the ICE district. I learned that today. Um, these are precincts that have multiple opportunities from green roofs to living walls to porous pavers, lots of opportunities across that precinct to slow and hold water, to return vegetation cover in a more ornamental fashion. Um, right up to the level of the whole city, the breathe strategy, the green network strategy tackles the whole city, offering a way to activate that green mosaic from little tiny site projects right up to large connected parks and ravine systems that are on the wild side. We can carry this right up to the regional scale and eventually to the continental scale if we speak the same language. The point is they're multifunctional. There are many benefits of connecting up these green dots. And when we recognize them and say what they're valuable for, it allows us to tackle some of the interjurisdictional problems and challenges we have in making planning decisions for these areas. We ought to remember, too, that they're performative. They have a performance value. They do something for us. Sometimes we call this ecosystem services. But for me, this is a problematic term because it means I then have to start counting dollars of the value of every blade of grass, every branch on the tree, how much water it holds. That's a useful calculation in some cases, but it also sometimes loses the point that the connective value of these things is more than monetary. And we should be unafraid to say that. These connected green spaces in our cities, together with land and water, provide us with a vital sense of well-being. Yes, they can be sustainable, which means they can lead to strategies for resilience, but they ought to be beautiful. We should not be afraid to say they deserve to be beautiful, because that's why we invest for the long term. It's not a frill, it's quality of life. So let's look at some precedents and practices that go across these uh, projects range from tiny little sites under a block, even at the space of a parking lot, uh, right up to large uh, city strategies. And I'm just going to hop through these quickly because I want to give you a kind of menu to show you that what you're doing is very much in tandem with what's happening in Europe, for example, in parts of South America, definitely in Australia, and other parts of Canada some parts of the US, of course, as well. What I'm interested in, though, is showing you examples that might be resonant um, here to Edmonton, not only to reaffirm that you're doing something really timely and, I would say, what is urgently needed, but that you can go farther and you can think imaginatively and creatively how to take your green network strategy further, to really make the most of the spaces that it's knitting together. This image shows an imaginary and hoped for set of green screens that are used to temporarily move water off the, do uh, the elevated expressway in Toronto. Uh, this is called, it's by Jackie Bruckner, it's called the green screens. It's a playful set of vegetated screens that are intended to move water in a way that celebrates its sound and its fury and uses it to irrigate a playing field in a way that's much more directed than just dumping the water off into the rain gutter. Stormwater um, overland filtration systems that we otherwise known as beautiful fountains. Um, they are quite frequently used across the Western Harbor in Malmö, Sweden, 
where water is recycled, every drop of rain that, follow, that falls is used at source to nourish, to irrigate, to be captured, and even for playful purposes. So these, these structures have a value that's serving in a, a, a slow and hold function for water. It's detaining it at surface, not discharging it over land, but it's, they're also beautiful. They're useful, they're part of the public realm. Green screens on parking garages in Malmö, Sweden, shade those areas in the summer heat, and at the same time when the deciduous leaves dry up and fall off in the winter, they allow light in, light at a time that is needed. Just like here in Edmonton, we're at 59 degrees north. I presume that you'd like a little more light sometimes in December, and maybe a little less in August. So we can use plants, of course, to our advantage in these small treatments, but they can be connected to larger strategies of heating and cooling. They're not just decorative or ornamental, although that's important for their use as well. Bioswales, green streets, complete streets, these are treatments at the street edge that are being used to slow, hold, and improve the quality of stormwater runoff. Whether they're planted with trees or grasses or irises or whatever species is appropriate for your context, they're serving multiple functions. They're also providing important corridors for other species, for birds, for pollinating insects. And porous pavers, while they don't always work uh, depending on the application in our freeze-thaw climate, they do have a role to play for in the summer months for sure, and there are materials that are available for our climate. So these are all very simple site-based strategies. When you step back and look how they are connected across a city that either encourages them, incentivizes them, or mandates them, they have the power to work at the landscape level. Even something as simple as temporarily retrofitting cracked pavement. Here in a Toronto example that was just uh, founded on my way to the airport, this is a colleague's project, a small community project at the level of the laneway that hasn't been paved properly in probably 15 years, they've created a planting mixture, happily called crack mix, and the project is called laneway puncture. So here you can be, feel comfortable about using crack in the laneway. Or in Vancouver, the SkyTrain, the way in which these planted gabion baskets or wall treatments are used along the SkyTrain, not only do they am ameliorate the sound and the noise in the train station, they provide a visual screen to look at, they provide a resting place for the odd bird who passes through, and of course they hold water that would normally be sheeting off and onto the tracks. Functional, beautiful, connected. On a larger scale in Berlin, an old railway yard has been repurposed, not by the expense of digging up the rails and creating a completely different landscape, but simply allowing the natural forest that's conducive to this area to crop up through the tracks while placing strategic pavement and walking areas around the trails. Südgelände Naturschutzpark is in the heart of Berlin, and it follows alongside one of the regional rail systems, so it's quite substantial for playing as well as for walking. Here's an example of a policy that can be turned into a design. If you're not a designer, the diagram may be daunting, but what's important that you take away from this image is that this is how we, I asked a group of um, landscape architectural students at the University of Toronto with whom I was working on this project, I said, please help people to understand what on earth the wet weather management policy is. The wet weather flow master plan, as it's now called, WUMPF would be the acronym, I think, if you're caring. This is a cross-section of how water la from rain lands on the surface of our city and moves across the surface eventually to a lake. When seen in section, we can all of a sudden see places to enter policy or enter a design. Underground piping costs a lot, but surface treatments can be a lot cheaper. And in this particular exercise, students looked at specific design treatments for each step of the drop of rain across the city's uh, ravine system. In Rotterdam, this is Water Square Park. Rotterdam, of course, a city that sits below sea level quite substantially and that is subject to the triple threat of rising sea level, increasing downstream flow from the rest of the Rhine and the Meuse and the Scheldt rivers, but also from melting glaciers in the Swiss Alps. So there's a lot of water in the wrong place at the wrong time. They need inventive design. So parks here take on a blue infrastructural uh, function, unlike in many other places. This is a public gathering space. It's a skateboard park. It's a fussball 
court, it's an amphitheater, and it's sometimes a pool. So it is multifunctional. It's urban design. There's not a lot of planting in that area, but it sure deals with water. And of course, on the day that I visited, um, it poured rain, and so we had the pool rather than the foosball. But we might think about these infrastructures as not only being multifunctional, but they can be zoned by time or by weather. So for planners who are worried about investing in one thing that does one thing at a time, at a particular time of day, we can have infrastructures like this that serve multiple purposes, 24 hours, four seasons, and are different, different uses at different times. Also in the Netherlands uh, project that I worked on with something called the Harvard uh, Netherlands Climate Change Research Project, we were looking at ways to use living infrastructure to ameliorate, ameliorate uh, the effects of urban water. And here we went back to the humble oyster and asked how do you activate an estuary in an area that's forgotten that it's really on the seashore? Can we use bivalves? Can we use naturally occurring organisms in the water to help build a shoreline to ameliorate wave action? Something that's being done in New York City right now by Kate Orff and Scape Design. This is the Rebuild by Design competition entry called Living Breakwaters, which is now being installed uh, in New York. Again, a way to combat storm surges and urban water using living infrastructure uh, a reef-based infrastructure that's designed and populated with sea creatures. So this is an exercise in putting those pieces together. This isn't just about a park. It's not about a play space, and it's not about a natural area. It's about everything from green roofs to living walls to porous pavers to green streets. How do we connect them across that spectrum from the site to the city to the region to the province and eventually to the continent? You can do that by starting with something like the Breathe strategy, a green network strategy, or in Toronto, our ravine strategy. So let me tell you a little bit about the ravine strategy uh, for the next 15 minutes or so. Very excited today, as I said. It just became public, so were it not for my intrepid interns who are working at the City of Toronto today, I would not be able to receive some of the diagrams I'm gonna show you since we were allowed to communicate those today. Um, and we've been working on it, I have to tell you, I'm gonna look at Grant, where are you, for five years. So Edmonton is the city that gets things done and you do it a lot faster, just saying. So our ravine strategy, like the Breathe Green Network strategy, has many similar goals. We're interested in connecting the pieces and we're interested in connecting them, not because it's convenient, but because the investment is realized at a larger scale. It can benefit a local community, but it benefits the whole city over the long term. So we're, we want to link the headwaters of our rivers through the streams, valleys, and ravines into trails and parks through those rivers right down to Lake Ontario. But more importantly than all of that, these connect people to place. And through that, they establish our identity, our identity as Torontonians and as people that are both riverfront and lakefront people. And as prairie dwellers, you're also dwellers around the North Saskatchewan River. It's a pretty prominent feature, I have to tell you, in case you've forgotten. I saw it flying in and was amazed. Again, every time I pass over the Saskatchewan River, I'm amazed at the power of this river to cut down through those incredible layers of fertile soil that you are so well known for. And maybe it is hidden in plain sight for you, but it's pretty dramatic something that we're seeing across our city in a different way, but also rec trying to recognize how do we maintain that asset before we lose it. Our ravines make up 17% of the total area of Toronto, so depending how you count them, that means about 11,000 hectares of mostly publicly owned, well, but 60% publicly owned, so it's barely mostly, um, it can be upwards around 18,000 if you include publicly accessible areas, which is kind of an interesting number because you have, I think, 11,000 hectares of protected space as well, if I'm not mistaken. So a city of 1 million people, 1.2 million people, has about the same asset as a city of almost 5 million people. Think about the wealth you are sitting on, in case you've forgotten, because it's really apparent to me we risk losing it at a much faster rate because our growth rate is even higher. We're looking at a population of around eight to nine million by 2030. I think you're looking at three million by 2050. 
correct, somebody will correct me who's Googling. But we are the ac accidental city. We have this ravine system in place because in 1954, after Hurricane Hazel, the city deemed these lands hazardous. They should not be developed because of the storm effect potential. They didn't protect them because they were a landscape infrastructural asset or a park. They protected them because they were hazardous. Isn't that great? Because here we are 50 years later and we have one of the most magnificent ravine systems in North America. But we're not doing such a good job of celebrating it or protecting it. Hence my admonishment to you to do more with breathe. Do more and go farther because you don't want to be the accidental city. You want to be the smart city that took advantage of an opportunity to invest today for a future. I don't know whether we have the largest ravine system in the world. A lot of people tell us we do. Depends on how you count it. What matters to me is that it's part of our natural wealth, our asset. And by the way, I pointed out earlier today in a shorter lecture, if you look carefully at this image, you can see a place where you might want to go, and I don't mean to Toronto, I mean to transit-oriented development. Guess where the subway lines are? You can follow them in the landscape, just like you can follow the ravines. There's a high degree of legibility, and when you invest in infrastructure, people come. The city, of course, also has the asset of biodiversity in the ravine systems, giving other creatures the space to roam, the freedom to move. And our biodiversity is, of course, incredibly important to us. In southern Ontario, you know, I know you don't need to be reminded, and it's a national sport to make fun of Toronto anyway, so I might as well too. We've lost a lot of our biodiversity. In fact, we are in a southernmost part of the country next to Kelowna, BC, one of the most biologically rich areas in this the southern part. But what are we doing to that southern part? Well, there's nine million Ontarians and growing. We're living on it, and we're building on it, and we're paving it. So the biodiversity hotspots for us are right in the downtown core. They're in our cities, in this 11,000 hectares that we better do something about. And so today, at noon, when we released our ravine strategy, you'll see some very similar language. And by the way, I'd like to point out there's a winter image. How great is that? Do we celebrate that we have not just images of people frolicking in their bathing suits? We are winter cities, and so the ravines to us have to be an asset all year round. They have to be an investment for four seasons, all week long, all day long, to five million people. And this means we have to start thinking about uh, seasonal use in a much more vigorous way. Hence some of my examples coming from northern climates, in particular Berlin, Stockholm, Malmö, Sweden, and Denmark different kind of snow architecture, but still, we need to show these images. We also might want to point out the resonance in some of the language. You'll see the word celebrate in our green strategy, just like in yours. This is a very different way of positioning what used to be thought of as a natural area strategy, something that just the people who were counting birds would be interested in. This is not so today. The breathe strategy, the ravine strategy, these are about celebrating our assets and giving people a place to gather for festivals, for mourning, for collective mourning and celebration across the board. So they are an investment in social infrastructure as much as they are an investment in green infrastructure. Planning for our ravine strategy has taken five years. We've been admonished for not thinking high enough for not making a plan that's ambitious as Stockholm's Five Fingers plan or the Green Wedges plan of Melbourne. I'm not interested in comparison, I'm interested in learning. So when we planned for our green strategy, we didn't know enough to look to Edmonton, but now we do. And as we roll out our strategy behind Edmonton's, we're going to have, I think, some good conversations to understand just how to celebrate this asset and how to continue the investment. One of our most popular urban writers, John Lawrence, tweeted a couple of days ago, look what steps, look at the view, just steps from one of the busiest subway stations in the country. Isn't that remarkable? Why don't we know about it? Why don't we cheer for this and invest more? Because this is the whole image. Looking south to the lake, this should give you, of course, in the summer, some sense of the extent and the breadth of green infrastructure. At the heart of this lies an expressway, but also an oil pipeline, a gas pipeline, an express rail line, a regional commuter line, 
a hydro corridor. Oh, and a really remarkable community center that is an old brick-making factory that's been repurposed into a center that champions sustainable community living. It just happens to be in a floodplain. And it happens to celebrate being on the doorstep of a river, something a lot of us in urban cities have forgotten about. So we're trying to hearken back to what were those values that provided people with an amenity to the outdoors, where this is the way a river ought to look, not full of garbage and junk and where a rail corridor beside a commuter road, beside a channelized river, can be transformed into a bike path, a walking pathway, gathering places, rain gardens, and a complete street. This is the street of the future in that busy neighborhood. In a place where only 7.5% of its natural cover remains, so we, need, we don't want to let it get any worse than that. You've got a lot more than 7.5% by the look of it. So you might want to start investing now. Don't make the mistake that some of the larger cities did by overlooking that asset. We're also looking at turning certain portions of the ravines into parks because they already are. They're just not called that. So we're rebranding some of these areas to, to highlight the asset we already have. Toronto's largest urban park is actually already there. We're just connecting the dots. In fact, our, the architectural critic for the Globe and Mail called it a super park. I think that's a bit of an overstatement, I'll say. I think that uh, St. Louis has a much larger park at its core. Uh, but the point is, it's pretty big, and it's something we ought to be celebrating. And by the way, it floods. So what do we do with a park that floods? Well, we have to figure out how to, if not just cope with that in our designs, actually make space for it. Make room for the river, as the Dutch would say. This is the Evergreen Brickworks facility in one of its three floods in the first two operating years, which they've now learned how to cope with, and in fact, how to manage in a way that combines good humor with Canadian resourcefulness and some humility, something I think you're familiar with. We also look at the path of the river, both in the wintertime and the summer, and find ways to use that in our designs going forward, not just ignoring it as a hazard. We connect it to other parks like Lake Ontario Park, a 900-acre waterfront park that stitches together uh, the Leslie Street Spit, which is infill from construction into the lake that is now major breeding bird habitat with cross-country ski trails in the winter and boating uh, routes in the summertime that has elevated walkways, pathways for rollerblading. We're turning this area into an amenity rather than the derelict space that was forgotten. Also at the waterfront, these ravines connect into a series of really beautiful new parks, parks that were built before the development because we were, for one time, smart enough to recognize that if we build the parks, people will come. So the investment into integrated stormwater management became an important part of designing a park. It had to do something. It had to treat that overland water, not just look beautiful. This is the artist's rendering. Um, here is the treatment plan before the water rushes back down into the lake and what it looks like today. So that kind of beautiful transformation and performance is possible. Springtime with the irises, nighttime with the fountains, and in the wintertime, a rather sublime place to skate. Uh, this is actually the summer, if you look at the trees. But in the wintertime, there's an ice pad. In the summertime, there's a splash pad. Corktown Common at the bend in the Don Valley uh, River is an exercise in flood management. But you might look at it today and say, oh, wait, is that a construction site? Yes, it is. It's the construction of a flood protection berm for the lower Don that protects the lower portion of the city from flooding. It also happens to be a children's play pavilion, and by the way, it happens to be quite beautiful. So when we look at this, what do we see? Do we see a pond with many varieties of birds and kids playing around it, um, or do we see a stormwater integrated management facility? I think we see a beautiful park, and it does a multiple, multiple things for us. What's most important for me in all of this, and relating the story of this um, connection across the landscape and the, this tissue that um, I talked about earlier that connects the city, is it's part of the very fabric of the whole future for us. This is the space that five million people really have to be outdoors in. 
I mean, look at it relative to the other areas. So for us, this means that we've got to capitalize on what we have now by stitching those pieces together in a creative mosaic, not just as single parks that we fight about whether or not to turn them into something else or um, add another feature to them. This is a reminder that design has agency for us. It has the power to change our perspective. And so here, in the heart of Canada's largest city, in this huge urban watershed of 365 square kilometers, it's right in the financial core of the city, more or less. 11,000 acres of ravine lands, a small community group challenged us. They challenged Torontonians five years ago to rethink space. They did it with a can of paint and an old building in a derelict spot that everybody had forgotten. And in this respect, a community group led the way by example. And so together now, in tandem with this community group leading the charge and reuniting people across the city from different agencies, we're testing these new strategies. We're finding tangible solutions to sustainability and also to resilience. And we're doing this because we are rethinking, remaking, reinventing, and most importantly, reaffirming a renewed relationship between our culture, our relationship with nature, and our relationship with what it is to be in a city. And so this brings me full circle, right back here to Edmonton, and I ask you to take a moment, breathe in your own flavor of green and blue, because, my friends, this is ecological urbanism, and it's our future. Thank you so much.